Okay. Um, the next round I think we're going to do is going to sort of follow the pattern of the blackjack game um, in that I want you to do another game and we will um, talk about it. I want to talk about the requirements of it, what you need to do. I want you to uh, then, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the requirements, we'll talk a little bit about the design, and uh, then I'll ask you, what would you like to see demonstrated? What, what, what lectures do you think help, what lectures do you think would help you get this solved? We sort of did that with the, with the um, blackjack game, and I tort, sort of abstracted certain aspects of the blackjack game, and we covered just those, because we've all observed the deal games, or not the deal games, but the deal applications, seem kind of big and unwieldy, and it's easy to lose track of things because so much is going on. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the old memory game. Sometimes it's called the memory game. I remember it as a game concentration. It was like a game show on TV. And uh, we'll play that first. I found a, an online site that allows you to play it. I'll show you the basic play, and then we'll play against a bot. Um, so we play now. This is a, a time thing, and um, there are six different pairs, and they're giving us 60 seconds to match them all. So I click Start. So I click this and this. Okay, that's not a match. This and this, that is a match. This and this, not a match. This and this, it is a match. This and this, it is a match. This and that, it is a match. This and that, it is a match. This and that, it is a match. All right, I got it done. I scored a 188. I don't know how they came up with that score, but they came up with it. All right, next level. There are three different tiles. And there's six, six pairs, so, well, we can do the math. Start. Ooh. All right, and so on. You get the idea. Uh, Ours doesn't have to have a timing component. Um, they also have the ability to play against a bot. And I think this is interesting, because when you play against a bot, it gives you a choice of um, how, how smart the bot is. And it gives you a choice of how big the grid is, and it gives you a choice of what to match, cards and numbers and shapes and all that. So we'll do cards. We'll do a six by six grid, and we'll play against the bright bot. Okay, that's somewhere in the middle. So I'll play. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, oh, they have to match exactly. Darn. Yay, I matched. Oh, I think I get to go again. There's, of course, a lot of variations of this game. Darn it. trouble. Cut the lead.
sad. <laughs> this is only this is only the easy bot, or this is like the middle of the road bot. I would say that's a dropping, all right? How do you think you could make a bot play better or play worse? If you, if you, had to, if you, had, if you were coding this, before we get into this, this is an interesting thing. Like, what are these levels, how do you think the levels would work? Simplest one would just be a random choice every time. Simplest one would be a random choice every, every time, all right? Okay, how long they remember. So, exactly. Uh, that's how I would do it. Like, maybe this remembers the last move, or two moves back, or three moves back. This one might remember five moves back. This one might remember eight moves back, 12 moves back. This one may never forget. <laughs> All right. Um, it wouldn't be fair to give it, like, the ability to read a card that wasn't clicked, you know, so I, I wouldn't think that would count, but it's how long it would remember, I would think, would do it. Okay, so here's your assignment, and I hope, I hope you guys like this, because it seems to me it would be a good way to teach this stuff. Uh, and again, feel free to give comments on that uh, if you want. Here's what I'm asking for eventually. Not asking for this week or next week, but I'm asking for eventually. And we'll probably do this in a three week cycle. All right, I would think. But I'll play it by ear. Um, whereas the first week, kind of like blackjack, get something done. <laughs> all right, have something to turn in that does something remotely like this. All right, then the second week, have it where it's functional, albeit crude. And then the third week, polish it up. If we need to take more weeks on that, that's fine. But here is the thought of this. All right. Here is a more exhaustive rule uh, list of the memory game. There's other names for it. Concentration, that's the one I remember from TV. You can also play it solo. Uh, my suggestion is you work on a solo version of it. And if you want to, maybe as your polishing up phase, integrate the bot into it. But you're welcome to do that. You lay all the cards down. We know all this. The one thing I did want to point out is if you're playing with a standard deck of cards, obviously there's not two jacks of clubs. All right? So in the standard version of this game, a jack would match any other jack. Okay? So a jack of clubs would match a jack of diamonds. A variation of it is that the jack of clubs would only match a jack of spades. So it would need to match the color and the face value of it. All right. Um, so feel free to um, implement that as an option. All right. I want you to use the deck and the card class from the previous assignment. You can make changes if necessary, but kind of notice if you made any changes to these, or if you can use them lock, stock, and barrel. Because if you can use them lock, stock, and barrel, guess what? You probably made a good class, because 
you've encapsulated the behavior that you'd want out of a deck of cards and an individual card. We're going to use the flag game as a pattern for this, which means that you will create a game fragment and a settings fragment. Display the fragment side by side in landscape mode on a tablet just as in the flag, flag game. The sentence fragment bothers me here, so I will correct it. There should be an option for how many cards there are. Now, you can express that option any way that you want to. If you notice the game that we played, it expressed the option on like telling you what do you want, a 6x6 six six grid, a 6x8, six a 4x4, four four, whatever. You could do it that way, or you could ask for the number of cards, or you could give a slidey control to say level of difficulty, and maybe at the low end of it would be a 4x4 four four, uh, matrix, maybe on the high end would be an 8x8 eight eight matrix, or something like that. It's up to you how you implement the number of cards. Of course, you have to make sure it's an even number, right? Because every card has to match with something. You also have to stack the deck, as it were, to make sure that you are, uh, are, are giving pairs of items, all right? So in other words, you shouldn't give, like, carry to the extreme if there was only four cards you shouldn't give the queen of diamonds, the queen of, the queen of diamonds, the queen of hearts, the jack of diamonds, and the king of diamonds, right? Because two of the cards wouldn't match up, all right? So you have to make sure that whatever cards you generate, you generate a match for it so that all the cards match with one other card, okay? So you should, you should have that as an option. You should also have on the option whether the face of the card and color must match or just the face. So in other words, is it enough, you know, does a jack match any other jack or does the jack only match the other jack of the same color? Just like the flag game, reset the game if the options change. The game should keep track of how many guesses it takes and the lowest, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the best score. The best score being the lowest score. If you want to somehow um, spin that score into a number, you're welcome to. For example, if you think about it, if there is a 4x4 four four array, um, the minimum guesses would be eight, right? Eight counting as clicking on a pair of cards. So if there's four by four, there's 16 cards. If you were clairvoyant, all right, and you clicked on a matching pair each time, that would be eight, all right, guesses. The worst case would be what? I would say the summation of uh, one through 15 whatever that works out to be. Because you could brute force it by clicking on the first card and then the second card, the first card and the third card, the first card and the fourth card. And worst case scenario, if you did that, at most you'd have the sum of uh, 1 through 15, I would, I think. That's what makes sense in my head as, as that. Um, so you could figure out some kind of way to give a, a grade based on the best case scenario and the worst case scenario on how many clicks it takes you. Uh, in between. Um, and you should store the best somewhere. All right? So you should store the best somewhere. So when it comes up, it shows on your GUI somewhere what the best score was. There should be a start game button and an end game button. That doesn't mean that they both have to be enabled at the same time. And include other elements you think would make for a good user experience. Boy, that's open-ended, right? Um, you know, maybe some animation. You know, you have a match, have the cards get big, whatever. All right? The flow of the, of the app should be logical. And 
and that one I know is sort of, sort of hard to quantify, but it's one of those things that like, you know, think of apps and things of, I, I assume you've all downloaded some apps or played with some apps or whatever. You know, some apps you pick up and you play instantly and you know how to play it and you don't have to give a second thought, right? It's very logical what you have to do. And if there's something that doesn't make sense to do, that button's not enabled or visible or whatever. Your blackjack games are a good example of that. Every blackjack game that I've graded so far, I've picked up and just played it. And it was perfectly logical. So carry forward that thought process in this to make it like just easy to play. All right, so that it makes sense. You know, if you get a chance, find someone and test it out on them. Find a kid. All right, because usually, you know, I, I guess you could, oh, I guess anyone could play this game, but this is kind of a game typically they do with kids. So maybe make it, um, uh, you know, maybe find a kid and, and play, uh, have them play it and, and see, um, see how they react to it and all that. Or, you know, if you don't have a kid available, you know, uh, find a friend or something, explain to them that, and just give them the game and let them play it and try it out. You can add other options as well. Um, some of the other options could be you could have a two you could have a two person version, all right. Uh, you could have it play against a bot, where as we talked about that a little bit, how uh, the bot would remember um, the last x number of moves depending on the difficulty. You could change from a deck of cards to something else. Um, like animal pictures or whatever. Um, anything that you think would make for a better user experience. Questions on this. Questions on the requirements. Now your first assignment is to create the first prototype. That's open-ended. My suggestion would be to do this. My suggestion would be to try to get as much as the mechanics of the game down, the user interaction, all right? That is, be able to start a game, assign listeners to the different cards, have it so that each turn involves clicking on two cards, and if it matches, make them go away. If it doesn't match, hide them again. So the mechanics of clicking a card, flipping it, clicking a second card, flipping it, if it matches, they go away. If it doesn't match, they're hidden again. Work on that, all right? And get as much done as far as that goes. doesn't have to be complete. Maybe you only have the on-click listener, so when you click on it, it shows, and then it, it hides after a while. Maybe that's all you do. All right, that's fine. The first prototype, I'm just looking for progress in this direction. My suggestion would be to not include the options until later on. Your second week, it should work kind of like the blackjack game did, Whereas you could play a hand of blackjack, well, you should be able to play a round of it the second week's assignment. So if you notice out here, I have the first week assignment, which is due November 1st, that's a week from this coming Thursday. And then I have week 12 out there already, which is going to be 2... week 10, right? Yeah, week 10. I'm ahead of myself a little bit. This is week 10. Week 11 is to create a second prototype and try to get the basic functionality down. Creating a grid, allowing the users a click, identifies there's a match, and so on. And then there'll be a third week of this to polish it up and do that. That's my initial aim, but we'll play it by ear and see how far you get. All right. I would think there'd at least be three weeks. If there's more, then there'll be more. All right.
right? Be honest. Do you like this assignment? Yeah. Okay. I like how it builds off of what we've done, and then, like you said, yeah. trying to build on top of that new functionality okay. that we haven't studied or especially if we're using our, our old code. Yeah, I, I think it's cool to use the old code. I think it's cool that we're doing something similar to the examples that we covered in class in D to one, but we're doing something different. And um, I think these are fun for me to teach. I mean, so, you know, I kind of kind of hope they translate to fun for you. And uh, if they're not fun, at least I hope they're worthwhile. <laughs> Questions about this? Okay, we talked about, I always talk about taking inventory of this, all right? And when I say take inventory of this, I, 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 what I mean is sort of think about what you need to do and then think about like, have you done this or not before? Or have we seen it before, all right? Um, just because you've seen it before doesn't mean that you know how to do it, right? I mean. I, I play the flute, and I've seen people play the flute well, but that doesn't mean I can do it, right? But it's the same thing. You may have seen a bit of code, but at least that's a starting point. So what I like to do is I like to take inventory of this and talk about the main features of it and talk about where we've seen it and then talk about, like, what pieces we haven't seen and maybe how we can get there. After that, I'd like to hear from you what parts of the – what pieces of the puzzle you're concerned about and you think that you need the most help with. All right? So let's go and draw this up on the board. Let's talk about it. First of all, let's think of what layout files we're going to need. All right. What layout files do we need? We need two separate ones for the, for the game and the Okay. We need a layout file for the game. And we need a layout file for the settings. All right. What else do we need? settings, then there'll be settings. In landscape mode, we're going to have the same thing side by side. portrait mode that's going to switch what fragment it's showing, all right, or well, maybe not that, but one for portrait mode that's going to show one of these, 
and a container for a landscape. That's going to show both. And then, this will be for the main activity. need a container for the settings. Or this guy. Or, could we get by with one container and just swap that activity out? That'll be something to look into. probably need, well, we need at least those. Let's look, and I won't bring it up on the screen, I'll just describe what the flag game has, so we know. Flag game, I'm pretty sure, has that. Has a game fragment XML, a settings fragment XML, a container for both, and then a landscape container. point is, is where did we see this kind of thing before we saw it in the flag game. So the flag game is going to be used quite a bit here. If we look at the flag game XML, There's the activity main, activity settings, content main, content settings, fragment main, fragment settings. So they actually have one more than, than I do. And then they have the landscape one. So. They have a content main and contact settings. That's what I've been calling the container. They have a fragment main and a fragment settings. That's what I've been calling game and settings. And then they have an activity main and activity settings. So they have two more than I have up there. You don't have to do it exactly like they do it. You could probably get by with less XML files if you want. Now, of these, I think the interesting one is a game XML. Because what is that going to look like? In the flag game, if you remember, the flag game and this game is going to be similar in the sense that in the sense that there's a variable number of things to click on. And the flag uh, uh, country names to, to pick the flag for. In this, what are we going to have? Well, it's up to you to come up with the options for the size, but I would think Two by two would be a bare minimum. Maybe better would be four by four. Maybe up to eight by eight. No, 
uh, eight by eight would be more than we have cards, right? Six by eight. That would work. Are we going to take the same approach that they did? If you remember right, what did they have in their XML? They had four linear layouts with each two buttons. show or hide the linear layouts based on the options of how many choices to give. Could we do that here? We could. All right. What I would suggest doing would be to have four by four Four by twelve, possibly. That would fit on the screen. You'd have to check to see. So you could have up to you could have twelve linear layouts. All right, and programmatically show and hide them based on the number of options that you want to have, the number of cards. Do we like that? Do we like the idea of having 12 linear layouts that we showed, 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 or hid, showed, shown? That we show or hide did. I'm not good on grammar today. Do we like that? It, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know if disorganized is the right word, but it seems like we're smarter than that, that we can do a better job than that. All right? For one thing, if we were to do that, we would have our thing would have four image views in it. show or hide. I would think it would be better if we programmatically created these. All right? So what does that mean by programmatically creating these? Maybe we have XML, an extra XML here, that we inflate, that represents maybe one card or maybe one row of cards. So instead of hard coding 12 of these in, and showing or hiding. My guess is it would be better to have a inflate XML that would contain a linear layout with four images in it. So we could create as many rows as we wanted to. Or we have simply a XML file that contains a single image that we inflate. The problem with this approach, if you will, is that we're limited to four things per row. All right? And is that a problem? I don't know. Maybe we would want to, if we were doing animal pictures, for example, or maybe if we bring two decks into it, Maybe we want to have an 8x8 grid instead of a 4x16 grid for 64 things. So maybe the, one of the questions, all right, 
to paraphrase Hamlet, is to inflate or not to inflate. All right? We can either define in our game all of the rows and images that we're ever going to need and show and hide them, or we're going to write code to programmatically create the linear layouts, images, etc. That would be, I think, one of your first decisions to think of. All right? Which one of those two approaches you want to take with that? Does that make sense? Okay. The rest of it should be fairly straightforward. Um, the settings is just going to be XML, very similar to what we had um, for the flag game, where you give some choices on some things. Uh, the containers are just going to contain these other things. I think the GUI for the uh, layout uh, for the game itself is going to be the problematic one. All right. How many listers are we going to have? How many listers are we going to have? How many click listeners are we going to have for the cards? How many click listeners were there in the flag game? For the flag? Pardon me? Okay. They actually had one listener, and they assigned that one listener to each flag. Okay. So we might be splitting hairs here and semantically. You know, we assigned a click listener to every flag, but there was simply one click listener object that was created. Then again, the method, uh, the, the method um, that the listener class overrides does have a, a view parameter. So it has a view parameter. So that's how you can tell which which object was clicked on. Exactly. That's how we know what object was clicked on. All right? So, in terms of that, what we're going to have is we're going to have an on-click listener that you click on, all right, uh, or that when it's clicked on, it's going to show the value of the card, and it's going to, um, and it's going to, um, Well, it might not do anything, all right, depending on whether it's the first or the second um, item that's clicked in that turn, all right. You have to keep track of what number you're on. Are you on the first click of a turn or the second click of a turn? That should be easy enough to, to uh, keep track of, right? We have an instance variable that we set to zero. You click on one thing, you increment it. You click on another thing, you increment it again. If it's two, then you, then you do something and reset it back to zero. So, let's talk about, let's talk about, how do I want to say this? Let's talk about how the click event is going to work. All right? We're going to have image views that have click events associated with them. We're going to attach to an image a click event. This is what the screen is going to look like. Let's do a simple four by four grid. Let's do a simple three, four by three grid. Each of these cards is going to be showing the back of the card. That's what the X means. 
say, the back of the card. So, if we click on this card, how do we know what card that is? How do we know what to make that image? Because essentially what we're going to have to do is change that image to the image of the card that that represents. How are we going to know that? Okay. There has to be a way to tie the view to the card. Okay? So how are we going to tie the view to the card? A numerical ID. A numerical ID. Yeah. Like, like how I did for the Blackjack project, I had, I had um, uh, numbers um, 1 to 13 to represent each um, number in, in, in a suit and, and increment by 13 to to um, differentiate between suits. Okay. Like how I like how I represent number two as uh, two of diamonds or something, or something like that. Okay. So what? Let's say this is let's say this is a queen of hearts. know if we click on that as Queen of Hearts. You're absolutely right. We need to associate the view with the card. Okay? So what if we had and I, I have to say, I've thought through this a fair amount. I haven't dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Alright? Depending on how much time I have and what examples I need to prepare, I'll be playing with this as well. What if we had an array of cards, or an array list of cards, or some kind of thing of cards that had a value so this is my this is my board and it's an array of cards an array of zero would be a card object that maybe would correspond to the Queen of Diamonds and board. So one would be a card object that corresponded to the two of spades. And so on down the line. Until we got to this, five. So board element. So five would be a card object that would contain the queen of hearts. So we're going to have to know somehow the position of the view in the board, right? So what we have to do now is we have to, our on-click event has to be smart enough to know that this is in the second row, second column. Then it can do the math, right? Because this will be row minus one times four which is the columns per row, minus one. I think if we can tell that, we can have an array of the number of cards, all right, and 
if we click on that, if we can determine the row and column of this, we can determine the subscript to that array. Does that work all the time? All right, let's see. This, this is sub 10, right? Because this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So what row is this? It's row 3. Minus 1 is 2. Times columns per row. I forgot something. Plus column minus 1. 2 times columns per row, that's 4. That's 8. Plus the column. 1, 2, 3. Minus 1 equals 10. So we can take that. If we know the row and column that got clicked, we know how many columns per row, we can figure out the position of an array that matches up the view with this. All right? That's one way to do it. All right? Why don't you generate the array first and then display it based on that array? I think, I think if, like, okay. like you, build, you build the array first, and okay. then you create the cards on, on the screen. How's the on-click event going to know what gets clicked on? It's, um, <clears throat> might have a, a loop, array list of views or something. Okay. That'd be a possibility. All right. Let's carry this thread through, because we can talk about some other possibilities here. Let's carry this thread through. How can we figure out the row and column of this? Do we know this guy's parent view? Yes, we do. If we figure out that guy's parent view, we could figure out what row it's in. All right? Because we, <laughs> we can look at, let's say this is a big old linear layout that's oriented vertically. And these are each linear layouts that are oriented horizontally. I'll bet I can figure out the column number by looking to see where this appears within its parent. Is it the first element? Is it the second element? Is it the third element? I could then find out the position of the row by going up a level. Its parent. What is its position within its parent? And it would be one, two, or three. So if I did that, I could figure out this stuff and I'm in business, all right? But as you mentioned, there's always another way. So I want to carry this through to its completion before I address your way, because your way is good too. What would you do? I would have um, what are those called parallel arrays, right? As I was creating these, and as I was creating the view, I'd have an array list of cards and an array list of views. All right, so array list of cards. And we'll call it a board. Let's call this cards and views because both of them together form the board. All right. Now, what we would have is we would have as we created the board, it's going to be tough to designate. I'm going to put a little A, B, C, D, G. That doesn't mean anything, those letters. They're not properties of the view or anything. I'm just, I just need a way to, just to point to a view without drawing a bunch of ugly lines on the screen. So, I draw my first card. Let's say the first card is a two of clubs. 
in my card array, card sub zero equals a card that corresponds to the two of clubs. View array, the views array sub zero is going to be what view? The view that I have an A next to. Okay? All the way down the line, I get to this one. My card five is a card which is a queen of hearts. Views sub five is going to be a view that's pointed to by F. Okay? So what happens when I click the view, my on-click listener? All right? If I do it with just one array, I have to figure out the row and column by looking at people's parents and grandparents. All right? I have to go up and down the family tree until I find out what row it is and what column it is. And then I do some math and add the subscript into the cards array list. <clears throat> if I do this, my on click gets passed to view, as was observed before. What are we going to do that with that view? We're going to loop through for in i equals zero, i less than views dot size i plus plus if view equals We have a winner, right? We found the view in that array list of views. And our subscript equals i. So we initialize subscript to 0. As we look through it, we look for that view. If we find that view, when we're done, here, sub is going to have the value of the subscript. And then, we go and look in the cards array to get the card, get the card image, and swap that image for the image that's currently in that view. What view? View V. All right? So, all we have to do when we create the card then, if we're inflating this, this is again how inflating is going to help us with this. I knew that having it hard-coded was a bad idea. As we inflate this, we get a card. We inflate and create the view. We put the view on our page somewhere. All right? We put the card in the array list of cards. We put the view in the, in the array list of views, and we're in business. And our on-click listener can go and do that. questions about any of this. What do you want me to cover on Thursday? It's Tuesday, right? So what do you want me to talk about on Thursday? More along this lines? Maybe a simple example of this? Pardon me? Animation. Okay. Yeah, like, like flipping the cards. Okay, we can talk about that. Although, in my mind, animation is the sizzle, not the steak. Right. All right? But we can definitely talk about that one. Yeah. I am thinking I will talk about this some more. And I will try to think of a simple example that I can do without giving away the farm. Okay? Um, maybe I'll do a coin flip. All right? Where we'll have multiple coins on the screen. And 
when I click it, it'll flip the coin to something dumb like that. All right? That might be that might be a good thing to do. I'll try to think of an abstracted example, though, where I'm not going to give you the code for this, but it gives you enough of a background to do this. How do you assign the uh, fragments to the main activity? That would uh, be a good thing to look Okay, that would be another one to look at. Okay. I'll try to include the, the I'll try to include the fragment in the example that I do for next. That would be like a game fragment. Yeah. We have a settings fragment, but the game one. Yeah, this, the the settings fragment is should be fairly straightforward, uh, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about. I'll do this. I'll do the coin flip game in a a fragment and pop that in there. So I hope I can get to this by next time. If not, I'll I'll work on it. I'll I'll develop it in class which again usually isn't a good idea because that's kind of walking on a tightrope, right? Because there's all kinds of gotchas that you don't think of, but what the heck, I can try it anyhow. All right, there's learning, you know, there's learning that can happen even when things go wrong, <laughs> when I lecture. I realized that in the class I had earlier today. I made like a dumb mistake and it was like, well, you know, give people a chance to see a dumb mistake and how you fix it, you know, so uh, we'll try it then. Don't they call that agile? Yeah, exactly. Agile development. Yeah. Or if I was Bob Ross, there's no mistakes. There's just happy accidents, right? So, okay. Uh, that's all I had. Um, is anyone going to lab? Are you going to lab? Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right. We'll see you on Thursday. Absolutely. Shared preferences for, for storing the score.